everyone. My name is Taffy Compain, and I'm the National Foster Care Specialist for the Children's Bureau, where I have the pleasure of leading the National Foster Care Month initiative in May. On behalf of the Children's Bureau, we want to thank you for participating in our challenges and successful practices for transitioning youth from congregate care webinar. Before we get started, our operator, Taylor, will cover the logistics of today's webinar. Thanks, Ms. Campaign. I will explain a few of the video capabilities for this webinar. We will leave time at the end of the presentations for questions. You can ask a question using the questions feature that is in the control panel at the top right corner of your screen. In addition, there is a feature that allows you to raise your hand. If you click on the hand, it will notify the organizer that you want to be recognized in order to ask a question verbally. Feel free to use those features at any time. Please know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the National Foster Care Month website in a few weeks. If you don't get your question, we will provide a document that provides answers to the most frequently asked questions that were submitted during this webinar. This Q&A document will be posted on the National Foster Care Month website along with today's presentation. Now I'll turn the meeting back over to Ms. Campaign. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, currently, there are over 400,000 children and youth in foster care. And as of the last reporting, 14% of these children were in a congregate care placement setting, which can be group homes, child care institutions, residential treatment facilities, or maternity homes. On average, they spend longer in foster care, age out without permanent connections, and have limited opportunities for normalcy. While about a quarter entered congregate care on account of a child behavior problem with no clinical, mental, or medical disability. These examples of possible outcomes for those in congregate care underscore the need for initial and ongoing assessments regarding the need and appropriateness of these placements with a focus on bringing them to permanency with lifelong connections. So today's objectives include Highlighting the importance of initial and ongoing individual assessments in congregate care settings, engaging the youth, caregivers, and the state agency in the transition process. We also want to stress the importance of providing appropriate services to support youth in congregate care, meaning individualized and tailored service plans. We will discuss the uh, strengths and the challenges of moving towards a permanency-driven approach. And we will also note some helpful resources, lessons learned, um, that will support those working with this population. Briefly, today's presenters include myself, uh, Melinda Baldwin. She's a Child Welfare Staff Development Specialist at the Children's Bureau. We also have from Hesiva Children's Association, Tom Zim, the clinical coordinator. And from Plummer Home, we have a team including Ray Pillage from the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families, James Lister, the Executive Director, Lauren Frey, and we're also very appreciative to have Chris and RJ, youth from Plummer Home, and also Kate, RJ's sister and permanent caregiver whom Plummer Home is supporting in the transition of RJ. So a little bit about our 2015 National Foster Care Month initiative. This is a collaborative effort uh, from the Children's Bureau, the Child Welfare Information Gateway, and partnerships we have with federal, state, and local agencies, organizations, and associations. We also provide a website that offers targeted information for youth, caregivers, professionals, and the community that focus on supporting and achieving permanency for youth and children in foster care. And in addition, we sponsor webinars such as this. We participate in local events. And with our various partners, we promote the campaign through numerous pub publications, blogs, and also social media activities. In order to find out more information about National Foster Care Month 2015, get to know the many faces of foster care, please visit https colon slash slash www.childwelfare.gov slash foster care month. So here is the home page for our National Foster Care Month initiative on the Child Welfare Information Gateway. This year's theme is Get to Know the Many Faces of Foster Care. 
and highlight the diversity of the children, youth, and families and the professionals involved in child welfare. We also draw attention to the fact that the definition of permanency is just as diverse as the people involved. Permanency can mean reunification, kinship care, guardianship, adoption, and key is the opportunity for lifelong permanent connections. In addition, we provide resources about, for example, how to plan for the appropriate placement of children and youth, including youth who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning, pregnant and parenting, and also tribal youth. Resources also highlight the efforts to reduce long-term placement of children in out-of-home care. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melinda Baldwin. Thanks, Taffy. Good afternoon. I'm Melinda Baldwin, and I work in the Capacity Building Division of the Children's Bureau. I have been interested in children who need the specialized care that congregate care can offer for many years. Here at the Bureau, we began looking at congregate care, not only because of the recent interest in this kind of placement, but also in an effort to understand the complex nature of congregate care. In March, the Children's Bureau issued a data brief providing a national look at the use of congregate care in child welfare. This brief was developed to provide a basic understanding of the use of congregate care and answer the following questions about its utilization. Who is placed in congregate care? How long do children stay in congregate care? Are there any predictive factors? And what are the jurisdictional differences in the use of congregate care? To answer these questions, we analyzed state reported data through the Adoption and Foster Care Analysis and Reporting System, the AFGARS data. We found that there are many different definitions of congregate care used in practice. For our work, however, we use the AFGARS definition, which defines congregate care as a placement setting of either group homes or institutions. We define group homes as a licensed or approved home providing 24-hour care in a small group setting of seven to, child, excuse me, seven to 12 children. An institution is defined as a licensed or approved child care facility operated by a public or private agency. They also provide 24-hour care and or treatment, typically for 12 or more children. Often these settings are called child care institutions, residential treatment facilities, or maternity homes. Although there is an appropriate role for congregate care placement in the continuum of foster care settings, there is a consensus among the Bureau and across multiple stakeholders that most children in use, but especially young children, are best served in a family setting. Congregate care should be used not as a default placement setting due to a lack of appropriate family-based care, but as a part of a continuum of interventions. The question is not if congregate care should ever be used, but when, for whom, and for how long. We believe that stays in congregate care should be based on the specialized behavior and mental health needs or clinical disabilities of children and used only for as long as, as is needed to stabilize the child or youth so they can return to a family-like setting. As you can see here on the slide, this viewpoint appears to be playing out in placement decisions. Over the past 10 years, the number of children being placed in congregate care settings has decreased at a greater rate than the number of children in foster care. Proportionately, children in congregate care comprised 18% of the foster care population in 2004 and 14% in 2013. While these trends suggest the child welfare practices is moving towards a more limited use of congregate care, the depth of improvement is not consistent across states, and in some states the use of congregate care has increased. At 37%, Congregate care use is decreasing at a greater rate than the overall foster care population at 21%. In addition to that point in time data, we examined congregate care use by age, those, age, those children age 12 and younger and those age 13 and older, by identifying cohorts of youth who entered care for the first time in years 2006, 7, and 8. We followed those groups of children forward for five years. We will focus on the youth who entered in 2008. In general, the point in time and cohort findings paralleled one another. 
Children under the age of 12 comprise 31% of the youth who are placed into congregate care, and almost half of those, 49%, have been placed in congregate care as their first placement setting. There were 6,518 children, age 12 and younger, whose first setting wasn't identifiable. Child development theory, federal legislation, and best practice confirm what we know intuitively. Children should be placed in settings that are developmentally appropriate and least restrictive. For young children, particularly those age 12 and under, it is particularly important for their developmental needs to be met in family-like settings. Yet, we see that wide variation among states and know that additional information on state practices, policies, and state-specific definitions of congregate care are important pieces of information to have if we are to better understand congregate care use for young children. 21 states have percentages above the national average of 31 percent. We focus the remainder of our data brief on those children aged 13 and older, those who comprise the greater proportion, 69 percent, of those youth in congregate care. In our analyses, we found that children in congregate care are not a homogeneous group, but present with multiple complex needs. We could effectively group these older children on the basis of diagnosed clinical disabilities and or removal and placement into foster care due to a child behavior problem. This analysis resulted in four subgroups. The first, children without a clinical diagnosis or child behavior problem indicator in AFGARS, but had very likely experienced some form of maltreatment. Secondly, children with at least a professional diagnosed mental health diagnosis according to the Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Third, children with a child behavior problem excluding all other disabilities, but who may ex have experienced some maltreatment. And finally, children with any clinical disabilities excluding those with a DSM diagnosis. These children have been reported as being visually hearing, visually, hearing, or cognitively impaired, physically disabled, or other conditions that require special medical attention. A bar graph is pictured on screen, displaying the percentage breakdowns of four subgroups. Subgroup 1, no clinical indicators. Children who do not have AFCARS indicators of a clinical disability, mental health diagnosis, or reported child behavior problem as a reason for removal from the home. This value reads 29%. Subgroup 2, DSM indicator. Children who have been reported as having been professionally diagnosed with a DSM mental health diagnosis. These children also may or may not have a disability or child behavior problem. This value reads 20%. Subgroup 3, CBP indicator. Children whose reasons for removal from home include having been identified as having a child behavior problem, CBP, but who have not been reported as having a disability or DSM diagnosis. This value reads 45%. Subgroup 4, Disability Indicator. Children who have been clinically diagnosed by a professional with a disability other than a DSM diagnosis. These children have been reported as being visually, hearing, or cognitively impaired, physically disabled, or other conditions that require special medical care. This value reads 5%. For the older youth population in congregate care, children whose reasons for removal from their home include having been identified as having a child behavior problem, but who do not have a reported DSM diagnosis, nor other disability, represented 44% of the children in the cohort. Children with a DSM diagnosis represented 21%. Children with a clinical disability other than a DSM diagnosis represented 6% and children with no clinical indicators comprom comprise nearly 29% of the children in the cohort. Among youth with a social-emotional issue, those with the child behavior problem were more likely to be placed into a congregate care for treatment. Youth with a DSM diagnosis were more likely to be subsequently placed in congregate care because they were not able to remain safely in a traditional foster family home. Overall results indicate that youth with a DSM indicator and a child behavior indicator may experience a need for higher levels of care. Children with a DSM diagnosis were more likely to have congregate care as a subsequent placement, be previously adopted, and have three or more placement moves compared to the other subgroups. 
children with a child behavior problem indicator were more likely to enter congregate care as their first placement, have only one or two placement moves, and exit to permanency. These children were also more likely to reenter care, be transferred to another agency, which may indicate a need for longer-term stabilization. Further analysis in our point-in-time data, those children in care as of September 30, 2013, demonstrate that children currently in congregate care are almost six times more likely to have a child behavior problem designation and three times more likely to have a DSM diagnosis compared to children in other foster care settings. On average, these children spent eight months in their current congregate care setting compared to 11 months for children in non-congregate care settings. However, the overall time in foster care was longer for the children in a congregate care setting compared to those who were in settings other than congregate care, with an average of 27 months. In addition to our data analysis, we also talked to nine states about their congregate care use. All had seen moderate to significant decreases, and we wanted to learn more about how this was done and or if they could share practices they felt were effective. We learned a tremendous amount, and as we saw with the overall quantitative numbers, there is a great variation in state perspectives and practices. All states noted they faced a variety of challenges in trying to best and most effectively serve children in settings other than congregate care. Synthesizing the quantitative and qualitative information, we felt recommending a tiered approach would move the field along in recognizing that congregate care should be used judiciously, efficiently, and effectively. First, we would create, we should be creative in the recruitment of resource families so that children can be placed in a family setting with a small amount of effort. Secondly, we need to design and implement more flexible and trauma-informed treatment programs that can better serve children with multiple higher-end needs. And finally, it's critical that we systematically evaluate congregate care programs to continue to better understand what works. We need to implement evidence-informed programming whenever we can. That concludes um, the description of our congregate care brief, and you can find that on the Children's Bureau website. I'd like to turn over the presentation to Tom Zim from Hepzibah Children's Association. Tom? Hello. Yeah, my name is Tom Zim. I'm the clinical coordinator at Hepzibah Children's Association. And Hepzibah is a congregate or a group home setting in Illinois. Uh, we have both male and female children between the ages of 3 and 12. Uh, the children that are placed at Hepzibah um, have been exposed to trauma, some forms of abuse, neglect. Um, they've been exhibiting behaviors that are unsafe. So some examples of unsafe behaviors would be like suicide risk or self-mutilation, self-harm, a danger to others, or sexually reactive behaviors. And as previously stated, the children have been separated from their families, from their home of origin, and many of them have experienced psychiatric hospitalization and multiple foster care placements. Our intake process at Hepzibah, we actually receive our referrals from the Illinois Department of Child and Family Services, um, the department, DCFS or IDCFS um, conducts a clinical intervention or placement preservation meeting, which they call a SIP, and they make a referral to Hepzibah based on the results of that clinical intervention for placement and preservation meeting. Another way that a child could get placed at Hepzibah is if at a psychiatric hospitalization, they do a clinical summary and a discharge plan, and they recommend that Hepzibah is the appropriate placement upon discharge from a psychiatric hospital. As far as our criteria here at Hepzibah, really it's our age. Uh, we take both male and female. Um, multiple placement disruptions is something that is part of the criteria in the sense that children are referred to our diagnostic center to do a more thorough and long-term evaluation to see the appropriateness of a child's placement back into a foster home versus a recommendation to be placed into another congregate care setting. And that's where Hepzibah is a little bit unique in the state of Illinois is 
our main focus is to provide services within a community setting that will help us to determine whether a child can be maintained and kept stable and safe in a foster care setting. Some of the services that we provide at Hepzibah, the therapeutic services upon placement, are individual therapy. We have we source that we actually have a, a source in the community um, named Ther Thrive. The name of that organization is Thrive, and they provide trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. Internally, we have an individual art therapist, and we also refer to specialized services. There's hospitals and other providers in the Chicagoland area that provide trauma-based therapies. Um, we also internally provide group therapy. We have art groups. We have a pause for strength pet therapy group. And then we also have internally, we have like a psychiatrist who does monthly consultation for medication management. Some of the things that are covered in TFCBT, we translate over to our MILU, which is part of the treatment within the MILU, in that some of those would be helping a child to identify triggers, help the, helping them to identify coping strategies, helping them to modulate their affect, modulate their internal stress by the use of a caregiver, and a lot of that is covered in TFCBT, so we have regular communication with our Thrive Therapists, and we work closely with the MILU so that we're reinforcing some of the progress in individual therapy on the MILU. As far as family services, at intake, we have an intake meeting, and one thing we emphasize in that meeting is to get identifying information and get our visitation schedule set at that first meeting. So in other words, we will identify all involved parents, we'll identify you know, identify resources as far as family or foster care placements that a child has had prior to Hepzibah, and we'll work to schedule those visits at intake. We have regular visitation supervised by a master's level social worker. We have capacity to refer for sibling therapy, for parenting and bonding assessments. Um, our case management helps to provide continuity of care. A lot of the children that come into our setting have multiple providers and multiple agencies working together to help service the family. We help to connect those agencies together. Then we also provide a report to the juvenile court and to the guardian at Leadham, who's the lawyer for the child. As far as education services are concerned, we, um, we have diagnostic school placements. We have an educational coordinator that works with the local, our local district. And what they do is most of the children come with an individualized education plan or an IEP. Um, a lot of times that IEP is either outdated or it hasn't been working. So our educational coordinator works very closely with the school to do either a reevaluation or to do an entire, to do a case study so that we develop an individual education plan that we think better represents what a child might need within an educational setting. Um, we also have stuff like homework helpers, tutoring. We have individual tutoring that takes place on site. Some of the challenges as far as transitioning children from our setting to a foster care are listed on the screen. What I would like to say, though, is that there are a number of variables that impact a transition from a congregate setting to a foster care placement, and those are not all listed on this slide. And we're focusing a little bit more on child factors in this slide, but there's a lot that could be talked about and probably spent, we could spend a lot of time on all those different variables. In this particular slide, we're just going to be talking about child factors for the most part. But some of the challenges are the child's behavioral and emotional needs and a child's risk behaviors. Um, basically unsafe behaviors like suicide risk, some of the things I listed earlier, those are some could be major challenges for placement in foster care. Um, the attachment templates impacted by abuse and neglect, grief and separation, really what that's about is teaching a child how to how to have a relationship with a caregiver who's going to consistently and predictably provide a safe emotional space for them so they, they start to learn how to utilize a caregiver to modulate their affect, to get their needs met, to stay safe. And mo a lot of the children that come into our setting have figured out a way to manage, but a lot of those strategies are either risky behaviors or they're acting out behaviors that are becoming, dis that, that are disrupting their lives. So 
in this setting, we try to help them to develop some strategies. Um, another, um, another challenge is that children have had prior experiences of failed placements. So in their minds, they don't have a reservoir of experiences that would support the safety of a foster home, the permanency of a foster home, the dependability of a foster home because they've had multiple placements that have come to an end. With, in some cases, there's, in a lot of cases, there's a limited connections between biological family and the child, and that's also a challenge to transitioning youth. And then there's a limited pool of specialized foster homes that can that are able to take a child in. So, and when a child is placed at Hepsibo, we start to determine their readiness for foster care, and some of that has to do with their, the success of their school placement. Once we have a successfully completed the case study, we've come up with an individualized education plan. We've looked at how that IEP is working to actually support the child in the school setting. And we start to see some stability. We start to see a decrease in risk behaviors. We see less incidents. We call them unusual incidents, but stuff like running, aggression, certain things that can, can really disrupt the child's day in, in the school. We start seeing a, dis, a, a decrease in those behaviors. And then we start to see an increase in their capacity to utilize supports within the school setting. So they're utilizing social workers, a teacher, maybe there's an adult mentor, a, a, um, a teacher, another teacher that's able to provide support to them, and they're able to utilize those relationships more. And when we start seeing a stability and a decrease in some of the traumatic stress symptoms, so avoidance is a huge symptom of traumatic stress, um, the activation levels fluctuating, so you'll have mood fluctuates fluctuating up and down. When some of those traumatic stress symptoms are also leveling off within the school setting, we know that they're getting ready for a foster care placement. In addition to that, we'll see we're looking at a lot of the similar stuff in the milieu. There, a child's capacity to utilize caregiver relationships and manage internal stress. As far as the some of the practical steps to transitioning to a foster home. We have a clinical staffing where we have all the different uh, providers at the table. So you'll have a, a private agency case manager. We'll have the guardian at LEADM will be at the table, any service providers, therapists, a psychologist that may have completed an assessment. Everyone would come to the table and we would determine that a child is ready to transition to a foster home. And at that time, we, we make a referral to one of our, a group that we call Moving On. And Moving On is a therapeutic group that is designed to ready a child to transition from congregate care into a foster home. So the rest of the time here, I'm going to talk specifically about our Moving On group. So the targeted population for Moving On is going to be some of the things that I listed earlier that are very similar to their readiness to foster to to be placed in, in specialized foster care. So we're seeing um, a decrease in risk behaviors. We're seeing an increased capacity to use to use coping strategies. Um, we're seeing some stabilization in school. Um, so that target group is is the group that gets referred to moving on. Um, in week one, um, the week one is called making it safe. Um, the, the first thing that we do in that initial group is discuss safety concerns. So the facilitator will talk about the need for safety, how to ensure safety for a foster child in the foster home. Uh, we'll talk about, we'll give the children actually an open forum to talk about their feelings as it relates to moving from our setting to a foster home. and. We'll talk about some of the things they've learned as far as healthy coping strategies to help manage their feelings. And the idea there is just to really settle in on safety. And safety is such a huge, um, um, an important thing for children that have been exposed to trauma and have, have had such inconsistency in their lives. Some of the activities that we do is we do, we start off with a team building agreement. Um, we talk about some of the rules, some of the structure. Some of the, and structure is real important in a group because it helps to reinforce safety for children when they know kind of what will happen during the group. We, we talk about consistent responses within the group. In other words, these are the sets of things that we really don't want to, 
to go on in a group. These are the ways that we can respect each other. These are some of the ways that you can reach out to the facilitator for support when you need it. In week two, we call it, that group is called Making It Mine. And the goal, the purpose of this group is to describe what life will be like in a foster home, to provide an opportunity for questions and answers, to address fears and concerns about change in daily living expectations from group living to a family setting. Some of the activities we make an individual cardboard house to create the child's vision of their own family home, including materials that symbolize safety, love, nurturing, support, etc. And then we wrap up with the healing home activity. In week three, we do a, that group is called Making It Work, Transitions, Rules, and Expectations in Relationships. So the purpose is to, to discuss daily living transitions, rules, expe expectations, and relationships uh, that take place within a family home, including focus on the child's abilities and understanding and strategies for managing such tasks as relationships to discuss feeling supported and safe in a family with adults who meet their needs. The activity that we do in that group is called Who Takes Care of Me? Matching Game and Daily Living Skills Dictionary. In group four, we call Making the Move. The purpose is to discuss what Hepzibah means to each of the children in a way that encourages internalization of gains made throughout their experience in group care and to empower them to utilize their individual strengths and the support of those around them during the transition from Hepzibah. The activity that we engage them in is to create a house. Each child will decorate the inside and outside of a wall that will build a unified home. The child can take their wall with them as a piece of Hepzibah to hold on to forever. Their inside wall will represent the child's memories of people, places, things, feelings, etc. of life at Hepzibah. Their outside wall will represent their hopes and dreams for their future placement once they leave Hepzibah. Uh, the wrap-up is a healing home activity and graduation. Each child will receive a certificate and an award of completion and be asked to complete a moving on program evaluation. We utilize a lot of what they learned at Hepzibah and help to translate that and help them to make that transition into their next setting. For a lot of the children that have lived at Hepzibah, this is their one true safe place, consistent place that they've lived. Um, because of the, the number of disruptions. So another thing that we have is our moving on to group. And the, one of the main differences, which we'll get in, in, in as I go through each one of these groups, is that they'll get a chance to practice with a practice foster parent. So I'll just kind of go through and read here some of my summary about this. The purpose is to better prepare children who have completed moving on for the transition into a foster home placement or a family setting. Uh, so the target population are children who have successfully completed moving on. And they've continued to utilize strategies. They're, they continue to be stable. They continue to, to utilize caregiver relationships. Um, in week one, it's the title of that is All About Me. So the purpose is to engage children in a discussion about the things that are important to them and to help the children identify goals they are working on caregivers they can talk to, coping skills they can use, and some of their personal interests. Uh, they create a me shirt to share something about who they are. They will design their own t-shirt that should tell something about their lives, their interests, things they enjoy, and what makes them happy. In week two, meet successful Hepzibah foster parents and their children, and the purpose is to provide an opportunity to meet foster and adoptive parents, their children, currently in foster placement or their adopted children and to provide the children with a forum to ask frank questions to receive honest answers regarding family relationships, rules, expectations, and other aspects of life in a foster family home. The activity, um, it, the goal will be to have at least three adopted foster children and three foster parents on a panel and the group leaders will assist the children in formulating questions prior to the panel and there's always a meal served. And then our third week, uh, we do the moving on game. So the purpose is to address the rewards, challenges, and possible outcomes upon leaving Hepzibah or while living in a group home, a foster home, or a relative family home. We have a game that we've created called Moving On, and this creative game encourages children to make positive choices and to experience the rewards, challenges, and possible outcomes in a family or a group setting. It employs the utilization of connection cards, 
um, cards to assist the child in utilizing their relationships to deal with potential joys, pitfalls, and crises they might experience. The game ends with three possible outcomes where the child can dialogue about going to live once they li going to where they will li live once they leave Hepzibah, uh, which could be a foster home or a biological family home, and in some cases a group home. And then the wrap-up, each child receives a certificate of completion and a trophy. And another aspect of moving on that we, that we employ in, in closing here is that once a child moves through moving on and moving on to, we, do some, we are able from time to time to have practice sessions. So we'll have a family that's agreed to be a practice home. We'll do a, an, introductory, an introduction process. And then that child will go off site with the foster family, do some things in the community. They'll spend, it'll gradually get, those visits will get longer and it'll last about a month and there'll be a visit each month and it culminates with an overnight stay in a foster home. And then there's a processing session afterwards. And the idea there is just to pr help a child to practice what it's like to move from Hepzibah and be in the community. So some of the, um, the planning for specialized Placement. We have the treatment team. Team conducts a broadcast, which will locate a specialized foster home. So now I'm transitioning back over to some of the practical stuff, and this is outside of the moving on group. So we're getting back to what does it, what all the treatment team is doing to help locate a home and help facilitate a transition from our our home to a foster home. So the treatment team will conduct a broadcast to locate a specialized foster home. Or, in, so, in a lot of cases, we're reaching out to relatives who may have been doing ongoing visits and have already expressed an interest to take this child, and we're, they're going to be the identified placement. In some cases, that's what happens as well. The team interviews prospective foster parents to determine, to determine the match. Um, <clears throat> we have found that it's not... It's important not only that they have a foster parent license and have some experience, but that we get a little bit of an idea of the match between the child and the foster family is something that's really important. And we do that through an interview. Uh, once we've identified a foster placement and they've agreed that they're going to take on the challenge and, and the teams all feel really comfortable, then we, we sit down with a meeting we map out the transition. So the foster parent will set up a schedule where it starts with a foster parent meeting the child here at the group home. And we'll have a couple of visits like that here on site. And then it'll transition to a longer visit in the community, but still around Hepzibah where they go out to lunch and do some things together in the community. And then we, we, that visit could become an unsupervised visit so the child gets comfortable with being with the foster parent away from our setting and then the child is brought back that same day. It gradually, our, foster, our social workers will then take the child out to the home, have dinner with the family, and spend some time in the home. The next visit, the social worker will bring the child back out to the home and leave the child there after they feel comfortable for several hours so they can have unsupervised time in the foster home. And then we move to and overnight visits, and then eventually weekend visits. And then our discharges are usually between four and eight weeks and usually averaging out to be around six weeks. Within that transition, we have check-in phone calls. So the t treatment team is working with the identified agency and the foster parent to make sure that things are set up. So we have a case manager assigned with the new agency. We have a therapist assigned before discharge. We have a psychiatrist located. We have mentoring, big brother, big sister services. All those things are located. Our educational coordinator is going to work with the new agency to identify the school, to meet with the school and identify what kind of supports and services they offer and whether they can meet the needs of the child in that school setting. We cannot register until the child is placed in the, in the home, but we can do work prior to placement. And then we also make sure that we cover with the receiving agency all the different visits that are scheduled and with family and with relationships with people that they've had all the, throughout their time at Hepzibah. So that is all that I have from Hepzibah Children's Association. This is Tom Zinn. If you would like more information on Hepzibah Children's Association, please visit their website at http colon slash slash www 
H-E-P-H-Z-I-B-A-H-H-O-M-E dot org. You may also contact Tom Zim, the clinical coordinator at Hefzibah Children's Home. His email address is T-Z-I-M-M at H-E-P-H-Z-I-B-A-H-H-O-M-E dot org. Thanks, Tom, um, for all that great information about the work that you're doing at Hepzibah. I'd like to turn the webinar over to James Lister with Plumber Home, and he'll uh, introduce the rest of his team. Thanks, James. Hi. Thank you, Melinda. My name is James Lister, and I'm the Executive Director of the Plumber Home for Boys, and today we're going to talk about how our, how our permanency practice is critical to the successful transition of youth from a congregate care setting to a family setting. And, and the Plumber Home team today consists of me, um, Lauren Fry, um, who is from 3P Consulting and our permanency consultant. And you'll be hearing from two of our youth, Chris, and you'll also be hearing from RJ. They are both in our independent living program, and RJ also has his sister, who we call Kay. So I will hand it over to Chris. And Ray Village, our state partner, is also joining us. Um, he's a regional director for the Department of Children and Families, our state uh, child welfare partner. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm an 18-year-old boy. Um, I live at the Plummer Home for the past nine months. Um, at the age of 18, I have signed a voluntary placement with um, DCF in this fall. I'll be transitioning from the Plummer Home to, to Salem State to study social work. Um, right now, I'm working to strengthen my family relationships, including recently reconnecting with my dad after many years of not seeing him in separation. I recently have became a finalist in a song writing competition on the river for teens and have performed my original music and many more at the State House. I enjoy cooking and cooking for my group home and peers once or twice a week. So Chris, uh, what are some of the challenges of being 18 and transitioning from a group home? Um, a lot of it is like having more freedom and you have to kind of find a way to use it more responsibly. Um, and you have to kind of manage your time and prioritize like what you want to get done first and what you want to get done last. Um, try to be your own self, not hide in other people's shower, shadows, and also try not to be an adult and figure out what's next in your life, like where, where am I going to live and how do I get my food and clothing. And so um, talk to us a little bit about how Plumber's program helped you to get ready, ready to transition after age 18. Um, when I moved up to Plumber Home, I was kind of put to do my own laundry and kind of budget and we, I had to work on a budget. So when I got when when I got my own money, my job, and went grocery shopping, I could plan for the meals of the week and kind of know when to spend it. Um, figure out what to cook and doing the cooking with a nutritionist and kind of figure out what's healthy will help me avoid a lot of freshman fifteen scams that are in uh, college. Um, the music program is one of the biggest things for me. Writing and performing music helps me express what I've gone through and gives people my life story and how I want um, and help me achieve my goals of the social work so people know where I'm coming from and how I want to help. Um, it also helped me reaching out to my family is important and kind of help you go back and make the family relationship stronger. And other programs I've been to, they have not done that. is the family and permanency work at Plummer, Chris? Um, for me, family has been up and down for me, but every day, every up and down, there is kind of a little piece of my puzzle that's been put back, to, put back together. Me and my mom really have not seen eye to eye for a really long time. Um, I haven't seen or talked to my dad since I was 16, but now I'm 18, so I'm communicating and visiting with him and kind of being father and son. Um, after that kind of conversation with me and my mom and my dad, they started talking again. Um, the next day that all that happened, I 
got a call from my mom saying thank you for all the kind of kind of the works and help me be a better person. Um, and then really sometimes you can never really have someone listen to you or bring them to something that you want to show them. Um, for example, my brother who said he thought he could do everything by himself and never need his family and all that, he kind of pushed away his family and kind of just put them away. And it kind of tore the fam all of us to pieces because we wanted to help him. We wanted to help him be a better person. Um, but it really took him a long time that he really needs the help of family and friends that are around him that he wants positive. But now, right now, he's living back with my mom and being a better positive role model. Um, it's really important kind of to understand that things don't happen really right away or when you want it to happen. It takes time, the connection of family or, like, any, any type of connection does not really happen right away. At other programs I have, have been to, no one really reached out to my mom, to my dad, but Plumber Home really kept calling them and trying to give them, the, like, the big thing that family is number one in this program. That's what they want. Um, kind of the definition for family is, for me, is family is the people that are around you, that are with you no matter what, even if they say things when they're mad, but they really don't mean it. The people who, re who you really can stand by, even through the bad and the good. Okay, well, thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate you sharing your uh, perspectives uh, with us this afternoon. And I will uh, now turn it over to um, Ray Pillage, who is the Northeast Regional Director at MassDCS. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to describe the situation in Massachusetts. At the end of 2014, there were 10,248 children in foster care and congregate care in the state. Um, each one of these children and youth uh, have permanency challenges and are at risk. In 2014, 808 youth aged out of care. More than half aged out on or about their 18th birthday. Uh, it also means that this number also means that we're signing on a lot of youth beyond their 18th birthday and trying to support them. Of the youth that aged out, 555 had a goal of APLA, which means that they didn't have a goal that was defined by a relationship to a family. I can't actually tell from the data how many don't have a permanent relationship with an adult. But um, I would say that it's a substantial amount. And 658 of these youth aged out of foster care or congregate care settings. The data shows that in spite of considerable effort and resources, we're not getting the outcomes we need for young people transitioning from care. To get better outcomes, we need to change how we practice, and both the state and providers need to change, and we need to be lined up together, not struggling over uh, what are effective practices. Research shows that young people who leave care without any permanent family connections are at significantly increased risk of homelessness, not graduating from high school, unemployment, pregnancy and reinvolvement in child welfare systems, and involvement in the justice system. Research also shows us that young people with family permanence are more likely to report better outcomes in areas of housing, personal community, and personal and community engagement, and in areas like having health insurance coverage. We know that 17 to 22 is a very important time in a young person's life. In addition to education and independent living skills, they have an array of other needs related to their social and emotional development, including a need for a sense of safety, a sense of belonging and connectedness, and development of a positive identity. For young people who have their social, social and emotional development disrupted by experiences in the child welfare system, isolation and loneliness can have an especially corrosive effect. Partnering with providers on these issues allows us to look at 
them through a non-institutional lens and try out different approaches to identify effective responses. The model that Plummer has been developing lines up with this knowledge and these goals. That's why we support what they're doing and why we're partnering with them. Now I'm going to turn it back to James. Thank you, Ray. Uh, so what we're going to do today is talk about how our permanency practice here is successful in transitioning youth from congregate care settings to family-based settings. But I'll start with a brief overview of Plummer Home. Um, today we'll focus on our group home programs. Um, and I'll explain to the programs. We'll talk about the process. We'll share our model of intervention. We'll talk a little more specifically about the permanency work the assessments that we use, and then the details around our step-down process. Um, like I said, we'll focus on our congregate care programs today, but so you better understand Plummer, we have a juvenile justice community-based program, we have treatment foster care homes, we have a group home for adolescent males ages 14 to 18 years old, a pre-independent living program for males ages 18 to 21, we have a uh, supported apartment program known as Pyramid for youth ages 18 to 21 years old. They have apartments um, in their own communities and we support them in their apartments. Um, I'll start by our, describing our transformation by our initial efforts. I was hired here at Plummer Home 10 years ago and um, we were, in my opinion, a very average group home. And I asked the support of the board when I was hired as the executive director to be able to make a range of improvements that I thought were necessary to create uh, an ideal or a Cadillac of group homes. And we made some changes such as we staffed higher than we needed to so we could uh, better support the kids. For example, we wouldn't have to pull a staff off the floor to maintain ratio to take someone to a doctor's appointment. We paid for things like tutoring. We made improvements to the building. We found mentors for the kids we work with. We got rid of um, institutional looking vans. We have family vehicles like minivans, so on and so forth. We created a work program for our kids so they can get paid to work in the community. We did a music program. We paid for sports, camping, and adventure based activities, chores, and allowance. And after our first kind of round of improvements, essentially improving the milieu, we reviewed 41 cases of youth discharged from Plummer in 2009, 2010, and 2011, plus those in residence at Plummer Home in December 2011. And what we learned was that the service plan goals upon referral to Plummer Home, almost half had goals of APLA and independent living, and slightly more than one-third had goals of reunification. And oftentimes, those that had goals of reunification had that goal as a placeholder because they were younger than the age 16, and you cannot have a goal of APLA until you're at the age of 16 here in Massachusetts. We also learned that most, upon discharge, most went to higher or locked levels of care. About one-third went AWOL, signed out, or left to stay with a friend, and left less than 15% were discharged to family and kin. And what did the data tell us? That for most youth, there was no clear goal to exit the system to reunification, adoption, or legal guardianship, inadequate progress toward an exit to family, and that no safe and stable parenting or network of family connections at discharge. It reiterated that better programming didn't necessarily mean better outcomes. The experience of care while being at Plummer had improved significantly. However, at discharge, the outcomes were still poor. So this inspired us to challenge what I believe to be a traditional residential approach, where the permanency work is not prioritized or measured. A, commitment, a committed adult mentor or connection is the best we can hope for, and that youth are given a choice of being parented or not, that youth are prepared to live independently of family. And I often think about the quarterly treatment plan meetings that we have with our kids. And I look through kind of my own personal experience as a social worker for the state before coming to Plummer Home. When I would go to meetings for kids that were in congregate care settings, and for example, if I was sitting in on a meeting for Johnny, who was on my caseload, 
and he had a goal of APLA, limited family connections, but was behaving well in the milieu, going to school, and working, that we would believe we were doing the best we can for Johnny. Um, all the meanwhile, there was no plan or expectation on having a family for him when it was time for him to discharge from congregate care. Um, I think back to a particular staff meeting um, when we were running through all the kids with our clinical staff and direct care staff, and the morale was extremely low. Despite all the changes we had made earlier, um, we were still discharging kids to homeless shelters. We went through a list of three or four kids that had discharged in the previous month, um, and two out of the four kids that were discharged were all brought to a, were brought to a homeless shelter. And so it was really sparked by the staff frustration to change the status quo. Uh, and we wanted this to be driven by a strategic plan for change. So we did a strategic plan and did all sorts of research that we needed to do, and we came to the conclusion that we noticed too many kids were aging out of foster care without family and not prepared for adulthood. So we shifted from a traditional group home to a permanency-focused group home that's youth-engaged, where the youth have a voice, and family-driven with family involvement and toward family outcomes. This led to our plumber model of intervention that has three core components. And each, each component has domains under that component. Permanency, where every youth has a safe and emotionally secure parenting relationship and a lifelong legal family. The two domains under permanency are parenting and family and safe, stable family living environment. Preparedness, every youth has the skills and support to meet his or her physical, emotional, educational, and economic needs. The domains under preparedness are health and wellness, economic, and educational, and community, where every youth has a safe place to live, a sense of belonging, and a chance to positively contribute to his or her community. The domains for community are safe, stable, community living environment, social skills, and community connectedness. In the premise, the idea of our model of intervention is that youth need all of those three components, permanency, preparedness, and community, to transition successfully to adulthood. And what I think is different about Plummer is the permanency element of this, the idea that as a congregate care provider, we are required and expected um, to make sure kids exit our program and ultimately the system to family. Um, so I think a lot of residential programs are really creative and do great work around community and preparedness, but historically, in terms of a residential provider, the idea of permanency driving your practice. So we'll take a quick look at some current data. Um, <clears throat> from August 2013 to April 30th, 2015, the average length of stay in Plummer Group Home was 8.1 months. Our earlier data back, data back in 2011 was significantly higher. And 28 youth discharged from the Plummer Home Group Home 25% were reunified with birth parents, and 25% went to pre-IL with no family connections. I mean, went to pre-IL with family connections. So there are kids that transitioned from our group home to our independent living program with family connections that they did not have when they came to our group home. Of the 18 youth who reside in our group home and pre-independent living program, all of them have their own permanency goal. So the state of Massachusetts requires us to have uh, a service plan goal for each of the kids we work with, for example, APLA. And we have our own plumber home goal that sometimes is not the same as a state goal. So um, it's not uncommon for us to have a youth that comes to us with a goal of APLA, but the plumber home goal is to reunify with grandmother. Um, Thirteen have a state permanency goal of APLA. And three youth in a group home with a goal of APLA will be discharged to reunification with a birth family in June. What helped us make the shift? A strong vision and strategic planning, setting priorities, finances and staff roles. Um, quickly on the, on the priorities, when I was hired, there were lots of needs here. And when we identified permanency as something that we needed to address, um, that became our financial priority. Um, we needed to upgrade our basketball court, we needed new vans, we needed a variety of things, but we prioritized 
the support, the staff support to advance permanency. And um, solid collaboration with our state partners. When we first started this permanency work, I met with our state partners and, and those in leadership roles. Um, Ray, who you heard from earlier, was one of the first people that I met with. And I met with him to say, we're going to think about doing our work differently as a congregate care provider um, and need your support in doing this. And that was critical to um, advancing the permanency and the transformation from a regular group home to a permanency-driven group home. Um, and now I will turn it over to Lauren, who's going to talk a little more specifically about the specifics of the permanency work that we do here. Okay, thanks so much, James. Um, so as James was mentioning, um, very often youth come to Plummer with a state permanency goal, and many times that, that permanency goal is not necessarily pointing towards reunification or adoption or legal guardianship or placement with a relative that's really going to help the youth exit the foster care system to family. So we are working, um, as James said, alongside the state to really develop a goal that's going to um, uh, help them to exit to family. And so in doing that, we want to strategically use some assessment, standardized assessment instruments when youth are referred to plumbers. So we use the uh, CANS, the Child and Adolescent Strengths and Needs, and which most of you are probably familiar with, a standardized tool, and pay particular attention to the domain that talks about social connections uh, on the CANS and really use that to start to identify some potential resources or the attachment figures or important family connections for that youth. We also use the Youth Connection Scale that was developed more recently by ANU Family Services. And what that is is a, um, a tool, again, to help um, identify the number of youth connections as well as um, the type of youth connections and be able to work with that youth, con youth connections over time and help develop them into uh, potentially being uh, a permanency resource for that youth or a lifelong connection. Um, in addition to those two um, tools, we also have developed a plumber intervention model rating scale. And it's a four-point rating scale that we um, use with youth when they um, come or first refer to plumber. And then we also continue to use it at 30-day intervals while they are um, um, you know, at the plumber. And then we also use it again upon discharge. And we use it at those 30-day in intervals because we don't want to um, find at discharge that we're not moving the work in the right direction. We want to be able to make uh, mid-course corrections in that work and really uh, design each next step of our work with that youth to work towards um, more uh, safer and healthier and more nurturing and permanent family relationships. So uh, the three major um, outcome areas on that intervention scale are permanency, which is defined as every youth having a safe and emotionally secure parenting relationship and a lifelong family, as well as preparedness, which is defined as every youth having the skills and support to meet his or her physical, emotional, educational, and economic needs. And finally, community where every youth has a safe place to live, a sense of belonging, and a chance to positively contribute to his or her community. And within those three outcome areas, there are eight different domains. I'm just going to give you a quick sample of one of the domains, which is family and parenting. And a one on that particular um, scale for family and parenting would be that if a youth was at a one, a level of one, it would mean they, when they came in, they may have no parenting or no connections to family. They might not recognize the need for parenting or resist the need for parenting or connections to family. They might be feeling very isolated, powerless, or hopeless about parenting and connections to family. Yeah, if they're moving to a two, it might mean they have minimal connections, but there are some. Maybe there's initially um, a potential relative or a caring adult that's been identified, but we're not sure what the outcome of that will be yet. And the youth might have a willingness to explore that parenting, but there still may need to be work. And then all the way up to a three or a four, where um, the youth has actually achieved a safe, lifelong, and nurturing, committed parenting relationship or, and or uh, lifelong connections to relatives. So in terms of the actual permanency approach at Plummer, it has three primary areas. We focus strongly on family search and engagement, 
We look at those relationships that are most important to the youth. We really want our youth engaged in identifying who's important to them in their life. Uh, we want to be doing outreach to family and engagement of family immediately when we start working with youth, persistently um, along the way and in an ongoing way at all phases of our intervention. And we want to involve those family members in treatment and in teaming, in planning for that youth. We also focus um, very closely on youth preparation for permanency because um, as uh, Tom talked about in the HEPSIBA presentation, the readiness piece is really essential. So even if we have a, you know, a family or a caring adult ready to be family to a youth, we have to make sure that that youth is prepared as possible to benefit from those relationships and participate in those relationships. So we use uh, individual time with permanency social worker that's consistent, um, weekly, one-to-one -one time. We also uh, do group work with peers uh, around permanency uh, content. And we also totally prioritize family contact and communication. It's become the, a priority area um, within programming at Plummer to make sure that our youth have uh, family time and, fa and communication with their family. And the third piece of the permanency approach is really youth-engaged teaming. Uh, as James was mentioning, we really want to make sure that we're partnering with our state agency toward um, realistic um, permanency goals and plans that are very individualized and that point towards that youth exiting the foster care system to safe and permanent family. And we want to use things like our rating scale to make sure that we are measuring uh, the benchmarks along the way in that process. So the step-down process at Plummer, there's a strong focus on stepping forward to family. That um, although we do have some youth that um, may step down to family that's not going to be permanent at the time, but to a lower, uh, you know, less intensive level of care, but still the work remains to how, how and when are they going to be able to step forward out of the system to family. There's a strong part priority on parenting rather than just placement. Um, so we are not just looking at the next, if it's a foster family that a youth is moving on to from Plummer, we're not thinking about it as a placement um, only. We are thinking about the opportunity for that to be a permanent parenting relationship for that youth. And if not, then the role of that foster family needs to be preparing them for permanent, uh, being in a permanent family. And um, again, a strong emphasis on family relationships, even when youth are moving to a supported apartment setting. We want them wrapped around um, with family members right around them to support them in that very important developmental move on to their apartment. So I am now going to uh, transition to um, RJ and Kay who will give us their perspectives on um, some of the questions related to youth transitioning from residential. I'm going to start by asking um, first RJ and then Kay to just introduce themselves. Hello, my name is RJ. I'm 19 years old. I've been a resident of Plummer Home for about three years. Upon turning 18, I decided to continue receiving services from DCF and signed a voluntary placement agreement. I will transition from Plummer Home over the summer and move in with my older sister, Kay. While at Plummer, my sister and I were reconnected after a long separation and are committed to having a strong relationship. I play several instruments and showcased my musical abilities at several events and shows including the one at the State House. I will attend community college for video game simulation and hope to be a video game designer and a video game music composer in the future. I'm Kay. I'm in my early 30s, and I have an unwavering commitment to my younger brother, RJ, who will be transitioning to my home this summer. I enjoy cooking. I am a poet who's shared my work at many events around the city of Boston. I describe myself as a clown with a strong personality. Okay. Thanks, RJ and Kay. Um, RJ, first, can you talk with us a little bit about the challenges of being 18 and transitioning from a group home? Well, one of the many challenges of transitioning from the group home to living with family would be 
the difference between my goals that I have for myself and the goals that DCF set in place. For example, I want to, you know, save up money and get a car and, you know, get more music equipment and other stuff like that and video games and whatever. Whereas DCF wants me to see my therapist on a, you know, weekly basis, at least have some time, like, have some part-time, like a part-time job or go to school as well as seeing my sister, of course, and other things. Another challenge, I guess, is that my mindset has to change from being a child to an adult because of the fact that I'm already at that age as an adult. I have to start learning how to budget. I have to start learning how to save money, how to, you know, get groceries, figure out everything that I have to do in order to survive outside of being in the group home. And going when going back to family, it could be hard because some youth, it could be a little bit harder for them to reconnect with family. And the fact that living situations can be different, whereas, well, more of rules. Rules can be a lot more different as of being in the group home, whereas living with family. So the structure can be a little bit different, and it might take time to adjust. Okay, and Kay, can you tell us the challenge that you see for youth being 18 and transitioning from a group home? Um, at 18, in my mind, you're an adult. So naturally, when you become independent, it's a shock. In my own life, I was 23 when RJ and I lost our mother. She passed away uh, due to metastatic pancreatic cancer. And it was really hard for me as an adult because, like I said, I was 23 years old, and people are a lot less likely to help you or look out for you when you're that old because they feel like you're growing and you should be able to maintain and handle things yourself. Um, I had some family connections during the whole losing my mom process that really some of them disconnected, some of them got stronger. But, you know, you know, one thing I decided to do was just to make sure I would stick around and be able to help RJ as much as possible because I think those sorts of things are important. Um, I guess the big challenge of being 18 and leaving a group home is having a strong sense of who you are and what you want. And RJ, how did Plumber's program particularly help you to get ready to transition after 18? Well, in all, Plumber actually helped me with a lot of things. It helped me with, you know, learning how to do the necessities, such as, you know, doing laundry, figuring out how to file your own taxes for tax returns, and doing your dishes, learning how to cook more food and all that other stuff, cook your own food. And it helped me with my communication skills along with me being introduced to the music group. Had I not been into the music group, I would have not been able to go to different places such as the State House and, you know, be a part of the community and learn how to, you know, get more, uh, more I should say is, I'd say just hmm, to to broaden my horizon and to talk to more people that I wouldn't have been able to meet, more or less. And the fact that I can go to these different events and say, I did this. Not many people have been able to go to a place like the State House and be able to perform. And Kay, how did Plumber's program help RJ to get ready to transition? Um, I think Plummer really helped him because when he was in foster care, he was in situations where people weren't necessarily listening to him or, you know, had his best interests at heart. When he got to Plummer, he was he was doing better. People were really focusing on his needs and what he needed to do and really helping him and lighting a fire under him to help motivate him and help him with whatever he needs to do. So, RJ, why was the permanency work so important? It was important in a lot of ways because it could better you as a person and you'll be able to have family support as well as other support. And it definitely helps people to have people who care on your side. And Kay, how about from your perspective? Why is that permanency work so important? I think if there's a situation where a youth actually has family who they can interact with and, you know, who's going to embrace them, I think it's extremely important because when you leave a situation where there are a lot of people that are basically forced to care about you as far as the other youth you interact with, when you go out into the real world, people don't always have that same approach with you. So it, I think it's good that he's getting everything he's getting here, so when he goes out into the real world, he's already ready and there's no surprises. If you would like more information on Plumber Home for Boys, please visit their website 
at www.plummerhome.org. You may also contact James Lister or Lauren Frey. James Lister is the executive director of the Plummer Home. He can be reached via email at jlister at plummerhome.org. Lauren Frey works with 3P Consulting, LLC. She can be reached via email at laurean at 3plc.net. You can also visit their website at www.3plc.net. Great. Well, I really want to thank Chris, RJ, and Kay, and Ray, who's our state partner, in sharing just a little bit or a few examples of what we do to use congregate, congregate care settings as a platform to transition youth back to family in the community. Thank you, James, um, and thank you to the Plumber team for such a, such a very insightful presentation. We do have some questions that have come in from the audience. Um, uh, Tom, what is the average length of stay for children at Hepzibah? It would depend on our, we have two programs. We have a diagnostic program in down, which is um, 16 children, and we have a longer term program. So our longer term program is between like 22 months and like 26 months, somewhere in there. And then our shorter term is around six months. Okay, thank you. And, and James, you talked so, so much about the, permanent, the importance of permanency work. And I wondered, you know, because Tom talked about that work that needs to be done with family members in order for that transition and subsequent placement to be successful. Can you talk a little bit about the work you do with the either resource or family members um, that will be potential resources for the, for the youth in your program? Sure, absolutely. Um, we really focus on in a strong outreach and engagement of those folks because very often by the time older youth get to Plummer, um, many of their relatives, the people that have been important to them, aren't even connected with them any, any longer. So we have a very strong component of outreaching to folks that the youth really wants to maintain connections with, get connected with, and start a relationship building process between them and the youth. Um, as well as how critical it is sometimes even before the relationship process building process starts, we want to make sure those um, important adults in a youth life are brought in and be part of their treatment planning team, uh, be really engaged in all the, um, uh, the different uh, opportunities at Plummer concurrently with the relationship building piece. Great. Thank you. Um, Tom, you talked just very briefly about the connections that the children at Hepzibah have with community. Can you talk a little bit more about how the children are integrated into those activities even while uh, they're placed at Hepzibah? Yeah, all of our children go to community-based schools. Uh, we do not have a school on site. And I think there's, last time I heard, we had between 13 and 15 separate community schools, and those offer up connections. We also find the children are able to participate in after-school programming and other activities connected to those community-based schools. Uh, we have uh, community-based activities in Oak Park, Illinois, so there's several activities through park districts, through local, uh, like a YMCA, things of that nature. We also have a lot of um, volunteer efforts, so people that are interested in giving back. Um, recently, recently we had a community <coughs> member um, help us create a technology center. Um, so we have big brothers and big sisters connected to the community. Um, so those are some of the ways. And we do a lot of activities in the community, um, um, some of which are like sometimes the kids are even giving back to the community through different efforts. So. It, it seems that you know both of you have talked very um, eloquently about that connection being so important, um, not only to to the children in the the home, but also as they transition um, out. Um, is there another question for for you, Tom? Do you have any outcome data? 
I don't have outcome data that I could share right now. No. Thanks. Um, and then I, for the folks at Plumber Home, you guys are starting to to collect um, the data that you're using with the individual measures. Um, do you have any preliminary results, or, or what are you finding um, in using those assessment tools? Right. Uh, we do not have the pre preliminary results today, but we will have them in July. So how exciting is that? Um, we'd be happy to provide that. We've been collecting one year of baseline data, of which we'll be uh, starting to analyze shortly and have those reports available in July. Wonderful. And are you finding that the four-point scale, I'm, I'm very excited about that scale, is are you seeing um, movement? I mean, is it, has it been a good scale to see movement over that those 30-day intervals? Uh, yes. So sometimes there's not a lot of movement, you know, within one 30-day interval, obviously. But what we're absolutely seeing, because at the same time, you know, concurrently, the length of stay for youth at Plummer is decreasing. So we have a shorter period of time. So we're, you know, expecting that we're not going to see certainly all our kids go from a one to a four. But we certainly already have many more kids who are twos or at least threes as we're preparing them to transition out of here. Um, where in the past, many more of our youth would have been actually rated at a one when they had to leave Plummer. And Lauren shared with you um, a one to four scale specific to permanency, we also measure along preparedness and community. So when we get our baseline, the, the data we've been collecting for the past year is measuring our effectiveness and advancing all the youth we work with in terms of their permanency, their preparedness and readiness for adulthood, and their connections to the community. Well, those will certainly be exciting results to see. I have one more question coming in. How are the services at, at both of your facilities paid for? Do you use Medicaid funding? Um, and do you take children from out of state? Um, I'll start, Tom, if that's OK. Yep. Um, our, our funding is from the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families. 75% of our funding is from the child welfare system. It's not Medicaid dollars. 25% um, of our funding comes from our development and fundraising efforts. And uh, a lot of the permanency work that we do, for example, permanency-specific social workers, additional funds for travel, um, paying for parents to come stay at hotels to do family visits, so on and so forth, that's all funded through our um, fundraising efforts. And at Hepsiba, we are funded through the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. And part of that does include Medicaid funding, so we do have that Medicaid apparatus of paperwork and audits to maintain. Um, and then about 30% of our funding is private donations. Great, thank you. Or do either of you take um, children from out of state? No, we do not. At Hepsimo, we do not. Right, same here. Okay. We do not. Um, and this is for you, James. Um, how do you recruit and develop foster homes for this long-term approach with older teens? Um, oftentimes, there are kids in our um, group home where we do um, family-specific recruitment uh, for them, and that's part of their transition, not only to permanency, but transition from the group home to a family-based setting. Uh, we also you know, advertise and recruit foster families in general, get them trained, and make sure um, we have appropriate matches with kids either from our current residential program or uh, youth referred directly to the foster care program. And really, the, uh, what we see here at Plummer with the older youth is really consistent with national best practice. And a one-to-one -one youth specific recruitment approach is the most effective. And very often, it's with um, caregivers, family members, uh, people who are known within that youth natural network rather than recruiting someone who they don't know to come into their life. So it sounds like you engage in a lot of family finding activities. Absolutely. Well, that is all the questions that, that we have. Um, are, do you, um, either of you have any remaining uh, thoughts to share? Um, can we listen to the questions and each other? 
Uh, this is Tom from Pepsiva. I do not. Nope, same here. Okay. Taffy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Melinda, and, and thank you for the rest of the team as well. Um, as we are wrapping up, I just want to let you know about some of the available resources that we have on the National Foster Care Month website. Um, again, that is Get to Know the Many Faces of Foster Care, HTTPS, colon, backslash, backslash, www.childwelfare.gov, backslash, foster care month. Uh, two particular resources that we want to highlight today is, one, uh, a national look at the use of congregate care in child welfare uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services, our Administration for Children and Families, and our Children's Bureau. Uh, and this is actually a brand new resource that we have out for you. And, it's, uh, and, and for those of you who don't need this information, this detailed information, please bear with us. We do have a few more minutes left on the call, but it's really important for those with disabilities, perhaps, that we read off the uh, complete link. Uh, but I do want to share a little bit more information about this, so please stay with us. Um, the link for this brief is at http colon backslash backslash www.acf.hhs.gov backslash programs backslash cv backslash success dash story backslash congregate slash care. And then one additional resource that we have is Redefining Residential, Strategic Interventions to Advance Youth Permanency. This is also a new resource for, uh, authored by the folks um, presenting just now from Plummer Home. And it is available at http colon backslash backslash www.aacrc-dc.org backslash page backslash aacrc Space position, space paper, space 13, space series, space strategic, space intervention, space advanced, space youth, space permanency. And of course, that uh, information will be also provided on um, the PowerPoints that you already have and afterwards uh, on, the, uh, on the information that will be put up uh, for the webinar. So we also wanted to let you know that uh, the webinar series, which includes both this uh, webinar today and a uh, webinar from last week on supporting permanency for LGBTQ youth in foster care. Um, the audio recordings for both of these and the materials and additional resources, they will be available on the National Foster Care Month website in the coming weeks. And uh, we would love for you to help us out. Uh, please look at the information for the evaluation survey. We really, really appreciate you attending the webinar. We look forward to your feedback. It really helps us to be able to approve as we continue to do these in support of Foster Care Month every year. So immediately following today's webinar, we'll send out the uh, pretty short uh, online survey, and, and we hope that you will take a moment to complete those. The URL address for the survey is http colon forward slash forward slash www.surveygizmo.com forward slash s3 forward slash 2127151 forward slash 2015 dash national dash foster dash care dash month dash webinar dash survey dash successes dash and dash challenges dash of dash transitioning dash youth dash from dash congregate dash care. And we really do hope that you also gained uh, very useful information to date. So finally, uh, we want to provide you uh, my contact information um, as uh, working on this National Foster Care Month initiative. Please feel free to reach out if you've got additional questions. Taffy Compain is a National Foster Care Specialist for the Children's Bureau. The address where she can be reached is 1250 Maryland Avenue, Southwest, Suite 8551, Washington, D.C., 20024. Taffy can be reached by phone at 202-205-7793, or she can be reached by email at ta 
www.acfy.compain at acf.hhs.gov. And on behalf of the Children's Bureau, we want to thank you all for joining us today. If you do have additional questions, please make sure that you get in touch with myself or Melinda Baldwin. And this concludes our webinar, so we thank you in advance and have a great afternoon.